It is a basic tenet of economics that if demand exceeds supply, then prices will rise. And occasionally there's a rapid increase in demand that will drive up prices so high that it becomes a bubble that can then burst. In the 1850s, just such a bubble was created when Queen Victoria started a fad. Queen Victoria had a huge collection of very special items, and that spurred others throughout the United Kingdom and elsewhere to try to develop their own collections of these beautiful items based on, on rarity and aesthetics. The object of their affection that drove such an increase in prices? Well, chickens. The history of what was called hen fever, or the chicken bubble, deserves to be remembered. In 1855, George P. Burnham published a book called The History of Hen Fever, A Humorous Record. In it he wrote that never in the history of modern bubbles did any mania exceed in ridiculousness or ludicrousness or in the number of its victims surpass this inexplicable humbug. Chickens weren't a rare sight in England. They were bred as farm animals for centuries. First domesticated in Southeast Asia around 8,000 years ago, chickens reached Europe around 2,800 years ago, and evidence suggests they arrived in England about 300 years later. They were common in Europe throughout much of recorded history. They were used for sport, cockfighting, as well as for food. Among the oldest recognized breeds in England include the Sussex, the Rocombe, and the Old English Game, as well as the Dorking Chicken. By the early 19th century, Sir John Saunders Seabright had sexually bred his own ornamental chicken breed, the Seabright. It wasn't, however, British breeders or breeds that first attracted the attention of Queen Victoria. Victoria was a well-known lover of animals, and from a young age kept dogs as constant companions. Raised under the Kensington system devised by her mother, Victoria was not allowed to socialize with children her own age, and in 1833, at the age of 13, she instead found a friend in a King Charles Spaniel named Dash, whom Victoria called Dear Dashy. One biographer called Dash the Queen's closest childhood companion. Victoria would own many dogs throughout her life, as well as parrots, pigeons, ponies, and even goats. She kept kangaroos, ostriches, and monkeys as well. She was also well known for enjoying animals in other settings. She frequented Regent's Park Zoo, the world's oldest scientific zoo, which opened in 1828, and accepted most of the various animals of the royal family's menagerie from the Tower of London in 1831 or 1832. It first opened to the public in 1847 and reported that her children were delighted with the giraffes and elephants in 1848. She would loan many of the exotic animals that the family received to the zoo, such as elephants, tigers, lions, and ostriches. She was also a fan and patron of George Wombell's Royal Menagerie, which traveled with an impressive collection of exotic animals. But in 1842, she received a gift that to a modern audience slightly seems considerably less exotic. Five hens and two roosters. The giver of this gift was Edward Belcher, a meticulous and effective surveyor and one of the most hated officers in the Royal Navy, thanks to his reputation for making life a living hell for his officers on every ship he commanded. The Dictionary of National Biography said of him that perhaps no officer of equal ability has ever succeeded in inspiring so much personal dislike. His wife, a stepdaughter of one of the famous mutineers on the bounty, later wrote an account of the mutiny that based her portrayal of the cruel Captain Bly on her husband, Edward. But perhaps his greatest impact on history is the chicken. His personal issues aside, he returned to England in 1842 after having participated in the first opium war in China, after having done the first British survey of Hong Kong. The chickens he brought with him were a Chinese breed, which the Queen called Cochin China Fowl. Exactly what breed of chicken they were is a little less clear, as it isn't certain where Belcher originally acquired the birds, but these Cochin chickens were special. Around three times the size of the typical English chicken, they also had feathers on their feet. They were also sometimes called Shanghai birds. According to a 19th century historian, Cochins came like giants upon the scene. They were seen and they conquered. Victoria was immediately enamored with the birds, which were nothing like the chickens of Victorian England, or indeed all of Europe, were accustomed to. The Illustrated London News wrote that these extraordinary birds are of gigantic size, and in their proportions very nearly allied to the family of bustards, to which in all probability they are approximately related. In fact, they had already acquired the name the ostrich fowl. Bustards, if you are unfamiliar, are a kind of large bird considered some of the world's heaviest flying birds. The paper also wrote glowingly about the bird's eggs of a deep mahogany color and of a delicious flavor. Prince Albert had grown up with an aviary in Germany and had brought birds with him to England upon his marriage. Beginning in 1842, he and the Queen oversaw work at Windsor on a royal aviary, which would hold chickens as well as doves, bustards, storks, and pheasants. 
Built by Messrs. Bedborough and Jenner, the semi-Gothic building they built had a central pavilion for inspecting the fowls, which had dovecote and several roosting houses. The chambers were spacious, airy, and of an equal and rather warm temperature, allowing the birds to make their nests as they would in the bramble-covered recesses of their original jungles. By 1849, her collection was very considerable, with a half-dozen extensive yards, numerous feeding houses, laying sheds, hospitals, and winter courts. Included in her collection were a number of the Cochin Chinas, as well as white Java Bantams, Bantams being smaller breeds of chickens, and splendid Bantams of Sir John Seabright's breed. Victoria had a sitting room where she could relax and enjoy her birds, and was proud enough of her collection that decorated hen's eggs were sent to royal relatives across the continent. The royal poultry keeper was also breeding the birds, and during the Great Famine in Ireland, several of the larger birds were sent to Ireland in the hopes that the new breeds would be able to alleviate the crisis. By 1845, the Queen's interest in chicken breeding was spreading to others in the UK, and the wealthy were acquiring breeding and exchanging their chickens, not for their eggs or their meat, but purely for their beauty. This kind of collecting and hobby became known as hen fever, or the fancy, a term which now can refer to any animal collecting hobby, such as cat fancy and dog fancy. 1845 saw the first English poultry show in London. These shows exhibit chickens, ducks, geese, guinea fowl, and turkeys. Pigeons, not always considered poultry, often appeared in these shows as well. In 1846, Victoria showed her own cochins at the Royal Dublin Show. Tens of thousands of people showed up to see the exotic birds when they were shown in Birmingham in 1850. Helping to popularize the chicken fancy also was the 1849 banning of cockfighting in the United Kingdom, with chicken breeding and poultry shows being offered as an alternative competition. 1853 saw the publication of The Poultry Book by the Rev. W. Wingfield and G. W. Johnson, Esquire, which offered some of the first full descriptions of various breeds and defended the poultry economy, writing, we remember in one of the old satirists of the Tudor period to observe the superlative of contempt to have been concentrated in the epithet, thou keeper of capons. Hence, those who gave their minds to poultry economy, we may legitimately conclude, were not among the highly esteemed. The authors bemoan that for decades, the profits arising from poultry are too inconsiderable to enter into the calculations of the farmer, and that until within the last ten years, it is not an exaggeration to say that improvement of poultry was totally neglected in this country but that now everyone acknowledges that poultry are just as capable of improvement as any other kind of farming stock. The growing popularity of fancy chickens was in fact transforming opinions on chickens in general, especially as livestock and as a food source. Perhaps more importantly for the economy of chicken, after 1845 prices of fancy chickens were exploding. The poultry book recounts a price of 40 guineas for a single Shanghai chicken and 100 pounds for 20 Spanish chickens. Adjusting for inflation, those prices are truly boggling. 40 guineas coming to about 5,600 pounds in 2022 and 100 pounds in 1853, equivalent to over 13,000 pounds today. Chickens, so cheap that they weren't even considered as profit to a farmer years before, were suddenly incredibly valuable. It wasn't just in the UK that hen fever caught on. In the United States, George Burnham's 1853 History of Hen Fever, a humorous record, recounted how the fad took America by storm while lampooning its absurdity. Burnham describes how in the summer of 1849 a friend commented positively on his chickens, swearing that while Burnham had only one kind of chicken, he had them all, and indeed had just that year bred several new kinds. He described the Cochin chickens humorously. They resembled giraffes much more than they did any other thing. In 1849, Boston held America's first poultry show. Burnham described the hurricane of excitement of the hen men, with the 10,000 people turning out to see the rare and curious and inexpressibly beautiful samples held in cages there. All of this despite the fact that the people of Boston already had chickens, unknown, unhonored, and unsung. But the public loved it. One commentator called the show, indeed, a magnificent exhibition. The show was the idea of John C. Bennett, because, he said, people were being deceived into the purchase of spurious fowls, supposing them to be purebloods. Success of the first show demanded a second the following year, then a national show in New York, and suddenly exhibitions and clubs were popping up all over the country. Suddenly eggs were selling for a dollar each, and a pair of chickens could go for as much as $120, the equivalent of around $3,600 today. Among the famous chicken breeds derived from this time was the Rhode Island Red, which was bred from Asian chickens such as the Cochin and Malay with Italian leghorn chickens after 1850. Brahma chickens, which appear to have been first bred in the United States, appear to also have come from the large, fluffy Shanghai chickens, possibly from crossbreeding with gray Chittagong chickens. 
Brahma chickens were officially named in 1852, and George Burnham himself sent nine of the Brahmins to Queen Victoria at the end of that year. The Illustrated London News said that the birds were of mammoth proportions and exquisite plumage. Demand was so great for these fancy chickens that Burnham describes grown men coming to his house to buy eggs and waiting for hours when he had none, just to be there when the chicken laid its next egg. The Poughkeepsie Journal wrote in 1850 that the California fever sinks into oblivion when compared to the hen fever. That California fever meaning the California gold rush. The early 1850s saw the mania go truly wild. Dorking chickens were sold for $40 a pair, while at a Birmingham show, two Seabright Bantams were sold for $125, according to an 1855 edition of the Courier Journal of Louisville, Kentucky. Even more ludicrously, a pair of Cochins was held for $700 in 1852. Demand in America was no less wild, where in Boston, three Cochins went for $100, or a pair of Chittagongs for 50 this was a small fortune of money in the 1850s, all being paid for chickens. George Burnham claimed that in 1853, sales of his chickens amounted to $23,000, or around $830,000 today. Burnham sent chickens to such luminaries at the time as Henry Clay and Daniel Webster. P.T. Barnum even got in on the game when he put on a national poultry show at his museum in Manhattan in 1854. But by 1855, the fever was slowing down. The chickens weren't as rare as they once were, bought and sold and bred across the United States and Britain, and while they could still demand some high prices, the upper classes grew bored of the game. Hundreds or thousands of breeders had put together enormous hutches and hen houses and spent fortunes attempting to get the best stock, but it was becoming clear by 1855 that no one really understood why they were raising the chickens, except to sell them again. Burnham describes getting letters where once excited breeders couldn't give the birds away. I am now the owner of nearly 300 of these infernal, cursed, miserable ghosts in feathered mail, which I cannot get rid of. As with all bubbles, when it bursts, there had been fortunes both made and lost, and many thousands of dollars tied up in chickens too expensive to feed or keep. Prices cratered, and the huge collection of fancy chickens became nothing more than egg layers and food. But the proliferation of these breeds did have some significant effect on the popularity of chicken as time went on. Many of these breeds were bred specifically to be better egg layers, and chickens the second half of the 19th century were both larger and laid more eggs than their predecessors. The advent of artificial incubation, along with the rationing of things like pork and beef in the First World War, would help turn chickens into a global food phenomenon. Between 1880 and 1890, the population of chickens in the U.S. nearly tripled, from 100 to 280 million chickens, raised not for their beauty anymore, but for their eggs and their meat. The fancy didn't die off completely. The first poultry club of Great Britain lasted only a few years, but in 1865 created the first standard reference for judges at poultry shows, and a reconstituted club in 1877 continued the standard. Perhaps most surprisingly, the bubble's aftermath benefited another famous figure, Charles Darwin. Although he didn't mention it much in On Origin of Species, published in 1859, Darwin was able to collect a large number of fancy chickens when their prices collapsed in the second half of the 1850s. Darwin was able to compare the selectively bred fancy chickens to their wild counterparts and examine morphological differences, which were more pronounced in chickens than in other farm animals. In particular, he studied Polish chickens, which had amazing plumes of feather that came out of their heads. Selective breeding for the trait was changing the way the chicken's bones formed as well. But the poultry economy has shifted, and commercial production has led us to rely on just a few standard breeds, and even some heritage breeds have faced issues with inbreeding as they are being bred towards those characteristics that are preferable to commercial breeders. And because of this, according to National Geographic, nearly a third of chicken breeds face extinction. This places the food supply at greater risk in case of the rise of pest or disease, and also threatens to deprive the world of the unique beauty of heritage chicken breeds. This risk to those breeds led the blog Biodiversity Heritage Library to opine, forget hen fever, let's hope for a hen revival. In a modern twist, the COVID lockdown has led to a sort of renewed hen fever, as CBS News noted last year. The coronavirus pandemic is propelling one new American pastime to new heights, with more people forced to hunker down at home, setting up coops and raising chickens in their backyards. Businesses that sell chicks, coops, and other supplies have seen a surge in demand since the pandemic took hold, with the ironic effect of increasing the number of Americans sickened by salmonella. Like any other economic bubble, hen fever had its winners and its losers, but it also had a large impact on modern society. It popularized the chicken as a food source, and it made the production of chickens much more practicable and profitable. 
Today, chickens are the number one preferred protein in the United States. And hen fever might not totally have faded because increasing demand means that since 1990, the number of chickens on Earth has doubled. Today, there are more chickens in the world than people. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.